Okay, day 866 of the 14 days to flatten the curve. I've been locked down in my bunker somewhere at an undisclosed location in Kentucky. I'm ready to come out now. I imagine I will find absolutely nothing has changed in exactly the same way it was in 2019. Let's get to it. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Another fabulous episode of IBF On Demand. I'm your hopeful and post-apocalyptic host, Eric Wilson. You can find me at eric at ibf.org. That is eric at ibf.org. Thank you for the follows, subscribes. You can find me on YouTube, LinkedIn, wherever you get your podcasts. Keep that coming. Keep following me. We do have our, a sponsor, Arkiva, driving business transformation by solving all what others cannot. So thank you, Arkiva, for being a part of this, a fabulous sponsor. We do have a lot of conferences coming up. We got a virtual financial planning conference, forecasting and planning conference uh, coming up in July 19th through 21st. Check that out. We also have some other conferences coming up in August. Uh, we have a virtual advanced forecasting coming up at the end of the year. I want you to check that one out as well. It talks about predictive analytics. We're going to talk about today. But it's actually a virtual boot camp that's going to be an exciting opportunity for you to really get into those skills we're going to be talking about today in a two-day workshop virtually. So check that out as well. Something has happened the past couple years. Okay. One of the things, we actually started this podcast two years as a response to COVID. We weren't able to go to conferences. We wanted to have connection to our membership. We wanted members to be able to, to continue to learn, share, and advance through this pandemic. So we actually started this podcast now two years ago and still going strong because that little something happened. Actually, if you look over the last two years, a lot of somethings have happened. And the companies that were most successful did things a little bit differently, and the Looking at it and talking to the companies that really had weathered this storm or continuing to weather this storm now through 2022, they did these following things. Number one, they focused on the data. Two-thirds of companies went to external data sources to try to explain something that was going on inside their own four walls. They started to branch out outside of their historic data to try to see forward-looking information. They focused on the information and what it was telling them. They did not overreact. They had no idea what was going on, so they didn't overreact to the information they were getting. They made smaller updates more frequently. A lot of organizations, 60% of organizations, went to some type of war room, 56%, 60%, whatever, it varied between there, went to some type of war room type of operations or a weekly cadence to their SNOP to try to get ahead of what was going on. They focused on collaboration, communication, and transparency, especially in the SNOP process, but they extended that into their external partners as well, working collaboratively, working on communication, being as transparent as possible, what they knew and what they didn't know. And the last thing that really separated out some of the more successful organizations, they were ahead of the curve and they focused on predictive analytics. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And of course, I have a great guest for this to be able to, to his impression of what predictive analytics, because he's been doing it for 25, 30 years now, really been, been talking about this. And I wanted to get him on to talk to you about it as well. Professor Keaton is a Heritage Foundation fellow, a Heartland Institute research fellow. He's just a great fellow. He's a former chair of the Department of Finance at Notre Dame. He is a founding member of the Wireless Institute at Notre Dame. His forecasting and predictive analytics textbook, now in its eighth edition with McGall Hill, is a best-selling forecasting book for use in college and universities worldwide. He's won multiple awards for his teaching. He serves on various boards, including the Board of Advisors for the Institute of Business Forecasting. Please help me welcome Barry Keaton. So welcome, Barry. Thank you for having me. 
I'm glad to have you. I think something's happened over these past couple years. We couldn't like come back in person, but I guess you've still been teaching for the past couple years, though, haven't you? Hey, the university has still had face-to-face classes right through the pandemic. Well, that's a lot exciting. of sanitizing <laughs> face-to-face classes. <laughs> well, with this little thing or things that have occurred over the last couple years, I mean, that's kind of changed planning. So, I mean, I don't know if you're teaching things differently now, but I know planners are doing things differently now. And, and I think that's really kind of it, almost a reset for our planning processes going forward. I mean, you talk a lot about, let's get, get right into it. You talk a lot about predictive analytics. I mean, how much different is that than kind of more the traditional way we did things a few years ago even. Is, is predictive analytics really different? It, uh, it really is. Let me explain it this way. Let me explain it in terms of the Institute of Business Forecasting. When I started working with Dr. Jane and Anish, oh, more than 25 years ago, everything we taught, uh, all of the conferences dealt with time series analysis. There may have been one or two sessions out of 20 that were on regression or a little bit of demand forecasting, but it basically was all time series. And then over time, what happened is it morphed and we began to see more and more demand planning and a little bit less, but not zero, time series. And now, as you know, what's happened is there's more analytics and a little less demand planning and a little less time series. of three stages, time series, and then demand planning, and then analytics. And each of those use very, very different models, as you know, very different algorithms. And the emphasis is different. The data you use is different. So even the name of of the IBF has changed. It used to just be the Institute of Business Forecasting. And then they thought, well, wait a minute, demand planning is really important now. It'll be the Institute of Business Forecasting and Planning. And it if they wanted to make the name even longer, I suppose what would they would do is Institute of Business Forecasting and Planning Analytics. Be a little bit ungainly. <laughs> yeah, our acronym may get a little long at that point. But hey, I'm game. I, I mean, I've been pushing predictive analytics for the past year. I know you've been you know, really pushing it longer than that. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to see kind of that migration that companies are going to from traditional time series to more predictive analytics. You mentioned the in-between part is the demand planning. So kind of that journey you just talked about. So where's the kind of the bridge or the dividing line between time series, level trend seasonality noise to demand planning? What, where's that bridge or dividing line there? There is a cutoff, but it's sort of a soft cutoff. Think of time series analysis where the forecaster actually determines or comes up with patterns that he wants or she wants to find in the data. Things like trend, seasonality, cyclicality, maybe the effects of uh, advertising. All of those kinds of things are internal to the company and the company has data on those things. So what you do is you say, I'm going to use an algorithm that looks for the specific patterns. And if the patterns are in the data, it will find them and it will project them out in the future. That kind of forecast is always going to be useful because it's easy to do. It's quick. So it's not going to go away. Time series isn't going anywhere. It's still incredibly useful. People will be using Holt Winters. People will be using autoregressive integrated moving averages, sometimes called Box Jenkins. They'll be using time series decomposition. But then something changed. We found out, wait a minute, there are a lot of things outside the firm that seem to affect the things that we're forecasting. What if we included, or what if we could in some way include those things in our models or in our algorithms? So we began to use simple regression and then multiple regression. And you began to bring in a lot more data. And then the problem became not the calculation or the models or the algorithms we were using. The problem became getting the data because the data wasn't internal to the firm. The data is now outside the firm. So you began collecting the data and you found out, wow, our forecasts are now more accurate because we're using more data. We've got not only internal data and we're not only looking for specific patterns 
we're sort of letting the data figure out what the patterns are. But then the ball game changed again. And we found out, wait a minute, all of the data we've been using is static data sitting in spreadsheets, just numbers and numbers on a page. That's not the way we think of data and analytics, as you know from your book. Uh, the data these days has different dimensions. As we used to think when we had uh, two or 300 observations in a regression, we had a lot of data. Now we may use two or three million uh, observations. In analytics, we call them records. It's the same thing as observations in a regression. But the data is, is not only different because of the size, the data is different because of the variety. We don't just use numbers on a spreadsheet. They may be not static, they may be dynamic, dynamic numbers, they may be streaming data. It may not be numbers, it could be text, it could be audio, it could be video. All of those things can be analyzed. But then it's different in terms of the velocity. The information we get, we want more current information. We don't want to wait for monthly information or just quarterly information. We maybe want information in the last day the last hour. And then finally, I think that uh, the data is different in terms of value. I think data these days is much more valuable than it was in the past. One thing we always talk to students about is never throw your data away. What you think may not be valuable, probably is valuable. Don't throw it away. I think we got a little bit of a rabbit hole we can go down here, Barry, because I mean, during the pandemic, we, IBF did a lot of research. Sixty, almost two thirds of uh, companies went to some external data point to try to explain what's happening. So we understand there is usefulness, most likely, in data outside of their own four walls. That said, I'm hearing a debate uh, between small data and big data. You mentioned correct everything. You may be useful sometime. At the same time, a lot of these companies are bringing in information that are more descriptive analytics. Hey, it rained yesterday, so therefore I sold more umbrellas yesterday. They're not explaining what's going forward. So how do you kind of dissect what's useful and what's not useful because we're drowning in data right now. How do we really start looking at what data we can use going forward? Well, let's talk about the one of the big things that changed right at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, when the pandemic started, digital purchases, purchases from places like Amazon, were increasing at about 1% a year. And they'd gotten up to, oh, let's see, it was about uh, uh, 18%. And then what happened is in the first six weeks of the pandemics in, in 2020, digital purchases went up by 10%. That's 10 years worth of digital purchases at the rate we had been seeing. And we realized the game had changed. So in order to do forecasting, what you really needed was you needed a lot more data and you needed it much, much more quickly. Now, your question was, which data do you need? How do you know which data you need? Well, in analytics, in a lot of the models that we use, and remember we call them algorithms in analytics, you don't need to figure out which data is the most important. You put it all in and you let the algorithm figure out which of data help predicting whatever it is you have to predict. In other words, you let the data speak. If you're doing time series analysis, let's go all the way back to stage one forecasting. If you do time series analysis, I say to the algorithm, look for trend, look for seasonality, look for cyclicality. When you use an analytics algorithm and you put the data in, you don't say look for this and this and this. You say look for any kind of a pattern. And because there is more than one pattern in almost all data, the patterns are overlaid on each other and it's very difficult to decompose them and figure out how many different patterns are in there and then project them to the future. But that's exactly the beauty of analytics. Those algorithms are so powerful that what they can do is decompose all of those patterns and then predict them in the future. All of that assumes, as you pointed out, that you have a lot of data. And I mean a lot of data, and it may be different kinds of data than what we were using in the past. Okay, so, I mean, that may sound some, some you know, companies that 
are still in stage one, you mentioned type. So is forecasting or even analytics and coding, are, I mean, are they related? Are we talking about coding? Is that what we're talking about? Or is it really analytics driven that things that people can do outside of coding? Think about going to one of the IBF conferences and uh, some presentation on how to effectively use Holt Winters. Still a very good tool. Do we teach them how to code that in R or Python or Spark? When is the last time you coded a Holt Winters algorithm in any one of those languages? The answer is probably, well, maybe I did it at one point in order to learn how the algorithm worked, but I haven't done it in years. I don't think I've done that in 20 or 25 years. Now, the same thing is true for the analytics algorithms. They tend to be incredibly complicated. So you see a lot of advertising for coding. Learn R, learn Python, learn Spark. Do you need to do that to be a data scientist? Do you need to do that to be a forecaster? And the answer is absolutely not. Because there are commercial packages where somebody who is really probably better at coding than you could ever hope to be has already done it for you. And as a matter of fact, a whole team of coders. So I'm talking about packages like IBM SPSS Modeler, not basic not basic uh, uh, IBM statistics, but Modeler, Modeler Pro, or SAS Enterprise Miner, or Frontline Systems Excel Miner. All of these packages do 99.9% .9 of what you want to do in analytics. Now, you have to learn how to use the package, and you have to learn enough about the algorithm so you don't get in trouble. But you don't have to do coding. Now, what about the other maybe 1%? Well, that's where coding comes in handy. It, it's great to know coding. Uh, if I write a little algorithm in Python to pre-process my data, that's great. I can hook it into any one of those packages. Those packages realize people will probably want to customize them a little. So Modeler, Enterprise Miner, and Excel Miner, each of them can be, can be customized. You can pop in a little bit of Python code. But do you have to be a coder? Absolutely not. Well, see, see, this is this is interesting. I, I probably got you on a couple months ago. And we could have had a debate because I did a podcast a couple months ago talking about encouraging people to really get their feet wet in Python. I mean, so you're saying planners, they don't need to go the Python route. They have enough tools available now if they understand the concepts that they could start doing some of this predictive analytics even without coding is what you're saying. Now, coding and and analytics are really two different skills you know you can code a lot of different things it's true most analytics algorithms are coded in r or python or spark but those languages can be used to do a lot of other things and being an expert coder gives you the ability to do all of those things but being a data scientist means you know how to use the particular algorithms that we found to be very useful k nearest neighbor support vector models uh, neural networks, all of those kinds of models, which look golly gee whiz to a brand new forecaster, can actually be taught uh, in a rudimentary sense in those six or eight hour workshops that we put on at the IBF. And then what happens is you become more skilled as time goes on. So the way to start is probably just like the IBF did. Start out with time series. When you feel comfortable with that, add some data, go to demand planning. When you feel comfortable with that, why not try some analytics? You, know, you can try some very simple algorithms first, and then they can get more complicated. And when you really feel comfortable, then you go to ensembles. You don't use one algorithm. You use two or three, four or five. The last time I did a research project, we used 13 algorithms all at the same time. And we took basically, you could think of it as an average, but it's not really an average, of the results that you get from them. And and the results were incredible. Okay. So we kind of have the progression for the demand planner. You, you've almost answered the next question uh, already, but I want to hear that answer again. Uh, you have all these different algorithms in, in the packages you talked about. And a lot of those, those 
can work with current advanced planning systems like an Archiva uh, or systems that people already have in place, you can augment a lot of the forecasting with some external. That, that said, not everybody can afford that. And the forecasting packages people have, people get overwhelmed. You mentioned all the different methods out there. So you have these forecasting solutions or advanced planning systems that have so many different algorithms. You have the person that's really at the stage one. How do you get them comfortable to understand the different algorithms that's out there? How do you get them comfortable to understand what exactly to use and which data to use? How do they, how do they progress in their journey to the next step? That's another good question. Uh, you, you know the answer to it as well as I do. And the IBF, <laughs> but I love to hear the it. <laughs> IBF workshops start out small with a couple of very simple algorithms that can be shown visually. As you know, we always start out with K nearest neighbor. And the reason is very simple. I can draw a picture of it and I can show you how it works without ever putting a number on the screen. <laughs> there aren't even any words on the screen. There's just a picture. And immediately you realize, is that how this works? Now, it doesn't matter how it's coded. How it's coded, else. You know how it works, and you can see the failings of it, but you also can see the power of it. And you're off to the races. You've got your first algorithm under the belt. You know the diagnostic statistics you need to take a look at, and you let the package actually do the calculation for you. The calculation is the easy part. So the difficult part is picking the algorithm and then understanding whether it's done a good job. And as you know, I'll show you how to do that in relatively period of time. Yep. I mean, that's the, the beauty of going to these conferences, going to these boot camps, is being able to understand the fundamentals, the kind of the concepts, and then you can start applying them going forward. And that's exactly right. One final question, uh, real quick, because I think I neglected this when we talked about that step one of time series, because I think there would be a, a step zero. Some of the audience is still on today of the sales forecast, that, that salesperson who's, who's bringing the information, they're aggregating those things. Is there still a place for that sales data coming into our process? Or has analytics just kind of gotten you know, rid of any type of judgment and opinion in the forecasting process? Oh, no. There's still a place for time series forecasting. Don't don't forget your time series forecast. I'm second one step below, one step before time series. This is the salesperson that's not even doing time series saying, "Hey, here's what I think we're going to do." That judgment, that subjective input from salespeople, is that still a part of the process? We haven't talked about that. For that, you know, the name for that is judge forecasting. It's the idea like you go and you you survey your your sales force. You've got 18 salespersons and you go out and, and, and ask them, could each of you tell me what you think you're going to sell in the next month? And then you aggregate that, average it out. That's a forecast. And it actually is, it, sometimes it's a very good short-term forecast. You don't, you don't do away with that. But now you could even make it better if you forecast with an entirely separate method and then combine the two forecasts. Combinatorial forecasting is a fancy name for taking two forecasts and turning them into one forecast. It works fabulously. We do it in analytics all the time, but we have a different name for it in analytics. We call it ensemble models. Okay. An ensemble model isn't just one algorithm, it's many algorithms working together. So yep, so, so what I heard then, like my ADHD, there's a whole spectrum but when it comes to, it comes to the forecasting process and journey, and everything's important. That's what I heard. <laughs> Thing is important. You know, uh, as you move on to each of these, these new methods or new stages, you find that you have the ability to forecast lots of different things, things that we've never thought about. You use analytics all the time. If you take a drive this afternoon and you have a car, let's say you bought in the last five years, you probably have an accident prevention system in it. I have a Subaru, it's called EyeSight. It has two stereoscopic cameras that look forward. It has a LiDAR system. What is it doing? What it's doing is it's a simple analytics model that does classifications. It looks ahead and said, is there a car there? 
Is the car coming towards me? Is the car going away from me? It's just asking simple questions, but it's coming up with the answers so quickly that what it does is it allows me to avoid accidents. And when it sees that there's a car in front of me and that it's closing on me very quickly, it'll apply the brakes. It may even turn the steering a little bit so that I avoid But it's a classification model. Now, you can't do that with demand planning. <laughs> you can't do that with time series, but you can do that with analytics. Analytics has, has given us a whole different range of things that we predict. And accident prevention is just one of those. See, I don't have that in my car, but I do have a wife and it works the same way. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, want, I want to thank you for being on the podcast today. It was some great insights and great information about predictive analytics and exactly where we've seen the field going for years, where I think it might have been uh, kind of escalated because of COVID over the past couple of years as well. Very good. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of it. See you at a conference and going forward. So it was a great interview I just did. He gave some great insights and kind of that journey of all the different stages or, or, or uh, variants of, of predictive analytics from sales forecasting to demand planning to predictive analytics and, and where you can go on your journey as well. When you're talking about predictive analytics so, so that we're kind of level set on what exactly the differences are. He mentioned a lot of the difference. The way I look at it is predictive analytics can handle more and different types of data. It uses more generally external variables in its methods and in its algorithms. It can determine which variables are then significant. He mentioned that then as well. With that, if you understand what variables are driving your uh, you know, forecast, what variables are driving different you know types of of models then you can start running simulations and scenarios so the next ones it allows you to run more of the whys so then you can start running more what ifs it generally loses you more more out advanced algorithms and technology we talked a little bit about that but one of the most important aspects of predictive analytics is it's more forward-looking opposed to looking at your external time series that occurred last year, two, three years ago, this is looking for those leading indicators, those causal factors, those relationship type variables that ex could explain something that's happening in the future. That's what really makes predictive analytics important and something to use going forward. So when you're looking at kind of that migration of analytics, starting with descriptive analytics, this is really telling us what has happened to a diagnostic type of analytics is telling us why maybe something occurred. Once you start understanding that, most of that's you're still in time series world. Then getting to predictive analytics is a process and strategy that uses a variety of advanced statistical algorithms to detect patterns, conditions that may occur in the future for insights into what will happen next. And I do want to mention one more thing, though, because we've gone from the descriptive to the diagnostic to the predictive. What you are really looking at maybe is the next generation in that we was in a New Orleans conference uh, for IBF. I actually did come out of the basement a couple months ago. Uh, so New Orleans conference, predictive analytics conference, what a lot of people were talking about there was prescriptive analytics, that next gen of an of of analytics, where really we can use this if to drive new behavior, truly demand shaping, not just shifting demand, but actually shaping demand, creating new demand patterns, using analytics and business rules to help really create new behavior in consumers is where we see going. And you're seeing a lot of that today. And you're going to see that really escalated over the next few years is really becoming that prescriptive analytics. Okay, full disclosure, I said I've already been out of the bunker. And also full disclosure, it's scary what I did see out there. So I got plenty of bourbon here. I'm in Kentucky, so I think I'm going back in the bunker. I know I'm just going to hunker down here for a little bit longer. My name is Eric Wilson. This is IBF On Demand. You can find me at eric at ibf.org. That's eric at ibf.org. Thank you, Arkiva, very much once again for sponsoring these. Driving business transformation by solving what others cannot. Check out IBF. 
IBF.org. Check out the conference that's coming up. I said we had that virtual financing, forecasting, and planning and budgeting conference coming up next month in July 19th through the 21st. It's going to be a great conference. It's virtual. Other virtual conferences are coming up in the future as well. I mentioned there is a predictive analytics, advanced business forecasting. Uh, it's a line to my book. Check out my book, but check out that boot camp coming up at the end of the year as well. We also have a lot of in-person conferences coming up. Our flagship in October. Uh, we have other boot camps uh, in Vegas. There's other in-person conferences. You can come back out for that as well. So what I want to leave you with is if you do go out, it is chaos out there, but don't forget the main thing when you go out, wash your hands.